Hi and welcome to another episode of the Guest List Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Guest. I am genuinely really excited to, for today's guest, uh, someone that I've met a couple of times over the last four or five years and an individual that has been truly inspirational um, to me and my journey. For those of you that haven't listened to uh, the Guest List Podcast before, podcast was born out of my uh, first book, Top Villa, um, doing really well, making lots of sales and growing a network that then started to come back to me with lots of questions, uh, questions that I couldn't necessarily always field. So I thought what better um, thing to do than create a podcast, get lots of guests with far more value than perhaps I could offer that can answer those questions for me. So uh, today's guest is no exception. I'm gonna run through their um, bio reasonably quickly. Um, Today's guest develops entrepreneurs to stand out, scale up and make a positive impact in the world. Passionate about making the most of the extraordinary times we live in and getting entrepreneurial teams solving meaningful problems. An award-winning business, Accelerators, focuses on developing personal brands, running successful campaigns and developing scalable business assets. This person has offices in London, Sydney and Toronto coordinating global teams that cover all time zones. More than 40,000 entrepreneurs have attended the workshops across 12 cities around the world and have met with more than 7,000 of them to talk strategy and implementation. Over 300 have embarked on accelerator programs. This individual has personally written four best-selling books on business and leadership and spoken all over the world at leading conferences, winning major awards awards for the work they've done with their clients. This person's background has always been entrepreneurial from running garage sales at the age of 10 and holding dance parties in teens to building a multi-million dollar business in their 20s. Believing business success happens through good design, no amount of passion or commitment can overcome a poorly designed business. Having worked with thousands of companies, this individual knows exactly how to design a lifestyle business geared for income and creative freedom and a performance business geared for scale and valuation. Really excited to speak with the co-founder of Score App and the um, the director of Dent Global, author of A Key Person of Influence, Oversubscribed, 24 Assets and Entrepreneur Revolution. Daniel Priestley, welcome onto the program. Hey, thank you very much for having me. Uh, It's an absolute pleasure. I am um, a little bit overwhelmed, if I'm honest. I know we've met a couple of times, but you know when you've got someone in your life that, I mean, you wouldn't even know it, but the amount of times I've read your books, the amount of times I've sat there and perhaps put into action the lessons that I've learned from certainly reading A Key Person of Influence, oversubscribed are the two big ones for me. Um, So first and foremost, a massive thank you. (laughs) Yeah, my pleasure. I mean, that's the fun thing about books, isn't it? You, you get into somebody else's head and, um, you know, you really, you really form a relationship with, with, um, with someone through a book. That's one of the reasons I love writing books yeah. is because, you know, they go out and build relationships like that. And um, uh, I've, I'm the same, right? If I'm reading somebody's book, uh, I always feel like I've got a connection with them and, and, uh, and that we're on the same page, quite literally. I think, I think with the world that we live in, with the um, introduction of social media and personal branding and all those elements, I think you become closer to people having sometimes never met, never spoke, never even exchanged messages. And we met four or five years ago in London, um, and I was one of perhaps a group of maybe 10 people um, sat around a table and we were talking. And you, and you wrote in my copy of The Key Person of Influence, the key construction person or key person in construction, sorry. Um, and I've got that on my shelf at home. As I say, I've read that book many times. And I think you set me on a path and on a journey to, I suppose, be more entrepreneurial. I'd chosen that path initially to even get me in the room. But from your perspective, to, to become an entrepreneur, to kind of develop that, that muscle, that skill set, what, what do you feel it takes from an individual? So entrepreneurship really combines um, three things. Um, Number one is that you're going after something commercial, right? You want to be successful in business. You want to, you want to run a profitable business. um, And, um, 
and you, you, you're attempting to have that outcome. So one of the key outcomes is a commercial outcome, right? So that's the obvious one. Um, the other thing that entrepreneurs do is they take risks. So that they're, they're in some way innovating or they are taking on something that may or may not work out. Um, and then finally, what they're doing is they're normally accessing resources beyond their own control. So they need to enroll people to get involved in this project. They need to um, get other people's money perhaps behind uh, the venture. So the more you're doing those three things, the more other people will call you entrepreneurial when those three things come together. So some form of commercial goal, uh, some form of uh, risk taking and some form of um, accessing resources that, that others don't have. So that's kind of the definition of entrepreneurship. If you have two out of three, it's not really entrepreneurship. So if you're um, taking risks and accessing resources, but it's not commercial, you might be a social change maker. Um, if you're accessing resources and um, commercial goals, but it's not your personal risk, you might be a leader of somebody else's organization. Right, so two out of three doesn't tend to add up, but then the third one, you know, when all three of those things happen, you've got entrepreneurship. Now today, entrepreneurship is also very much about having purpose, passion, wanting to express yourself in the world, um, making a dent in the universe, right? Making making an impact through business. So you're trying to use a business as a force for good is very common um, there as well. So you're you're not only just building a business for commercial success. You want to build a business that's commercially successful and also makes positive impact in the world. So that's probably a new ingredient that's popped up more recently. Um, that's part of the, the entrepreneur DNA. Um, if we look at where we are as a society, um, you know, there was a time where we were all farmers called the agricultural age. And we all run our own little businesses of some sort, whether it was a little tiny plot of land or it was a bigger farm um, or it was, you know, butcher baker, candlestick maker in the high street. Right, so that was the, the agricultural age, and then the industrial age happened, and that basically meant that the very, very wealthiest people could afford to be business owners, and they could set up a factory, and then everyone else had to go working in the factory. So you essentially, um, if you were not rich enough to be able to build a massive factory production line, and you know negotiate with steel smelters and big investment banks and all that sort of stuff. If you weren't in that category of person, then you were on the factory floor, right? There was no pathway from the factory floor to the factory office. Um, you couldn't go from business worker to business owner, right? So that was for 150 years or more. And then suddenly something happened in the 1970s and 80s, personal computing came along and sparked a new revolution. By the time we went into the 90s, we saw people with home offices, personal computers in every home. As we got into the 2000s, people started to realize that they had uh, something called the means of production under their own roof. Um, they could actually produce something themselves. Now, where we are today is that you don't just have the means of production. You've got a film studio in your pocket. You've got global banking uh, you know, in your pocket. You've got the ability to you know, send money uh, whizzing around the world. You've got the ability to collect orders from anywhere in the world. There's businesses that have raised hundreds of millions of dollars to build software that you can access for $9 a month. Um, you know, there's free access to Facebook and YouTube and Instagram so you can promote what you do. Uh, you can connect with almost any person on the planet by tweeting them or, or sending them a DM. So we now live in this world where it makes very, very little sense for people to be a factory worker when they could be a factory owner. Right, where you can own your own means of production and have your own have your own business uh, and also work in your own business. So the the lines have blurred. Um, the way that talented people want to live and work right now is very different to the way talented people wanted to live and work fifty years ago. That's a really good his, history lesson done in a, in a few minutes there. But there's so many there's so many points along that path. I, I remember um, there's there's one element or one of the key lessons for me. From, from kind of reading your books and, and listening and following your journey, it was about the ability to grow online assets, the ability for people to connect with you um, by doing a simple Google search and seeing various things that, that you're associated with. Obviously, it's got to be good stuff and you've got to be able to have built a, um, a brand that people can connect with. 
Um, we mentioned off air before this about some of the awards that you've been to. Just give me a, a quick summary in terms of what's happened to you the last few weeks. Uh, yeah, so we've won quite a few. We've been winning a, a lot of awards. We're an Investors in People Gold accredited company, which we're very proud of and uh, accredited with Institute of Leadership and Management. But we've also recently won Business Advisor of the Year, Business Enabler of the Year, which is a very prestigious bank, um, a prestigious award from Lloyds Bank. Uh, with Lloyds, I was finalist for Entrepreneur of the Year, and more recently for the Business Champion Awards, I was Entrepreneur of the Year. So a few, um, a few good awards there. But the ability to to have that go out on social media publications out there to be searchable um, raises the credibility and the profile far quicker than perhaps what it would have done years ago before the age of the, the computer. Yeah, before digital. Um, the key assets that our business ran on were physical assets. So prior to 1970, um, accountants used to essentially value a business by looking at their balance sheet assets. So they would basically go to the balance sheet and they'd say, well, you've got this big block of land, you've got all this lumber, uh, you've got a lumber mill, you've got all this plant equipment and machinery, here's what it costs new, let's discount it, you know, and, you know, it's going to be worthless in 20 years. So let's discount it over 20 years. Right. And they basically worked out the balance sheet assets and very rarely, and sometimes occasionally a business was worth a little bit more than its balance sheet. Um, so, you know, there might be a million worth of uh, assets on the balance sheet, but the business would be sold for 1.2 million. So they would call that um, uh, goodwill. So they just had this weird word called goodwill, um, or sometimes they'd call it the intangible value. And it was normally about 5 to 20%, right? A very little thing called goodwill or, or, or something like that. Now, what happened once we got into the digital age is that the most valuable companies on the planet, the S&P 500 and FTSE 100 and all of those sorts of businesses, their balance sheet is less than 15% of their valuation. So if you go to the balance sheet and have a look at the traditional assets on their balance sheet, uh, you know, they might be worth 100 billion on, on the stock market value and they've got, you know, a few billion worth of actual assets. You know, they've got some computers and some chairs and some buildings, leases, um, and they've got, you know, a few things that you can traditionally value. And what happens is that we're still calling this, you know, goodwill or intangible value, which is kind of weird. It's like, you know, we just don't have good words for, for what's really going on. Um, but what's actually happening is the most valuable assets in the economy right now are things like your position in people's mind. So if I say the word um, energy drink, uh, you probably think of a brand called Red Bull, right? If I say um, elite university, you think of Harvard University. If I say search, you think of Google. So that, that's called positioning. So positioning is an asset, right? So one of the primary assets that companies jostle for is the position of their business in the marketplace. Um, there's another asset, which is uh, channels to market, having people who are willing to promote you, having people who are willing to talk about you, uh, you know, influencers who are, who are happy to be featured with your product, right? So that, that's a new asset. Um, there's something called intellectual property, which is you know, your ability to, and I'm not talking about the legal definition of intellectual property, but I'm talking about more your methods, your ways, your, your strategies that are proprietary to your business. Um, uh, there, you know, there's culture, uh, having a culture where people want to work, talented people want to come and work in your company. Now that is a massively valuable asset that doesn't show up on anyone's balance sheet. So things like an award, uh, mentioning an award, these are modern day assets because an award shows position in the market, um, it indicates that you've probably got a good culture. Um, it indicates that uh, an influencer or a channel to market would, would be open to um, working with you. So all of these things actually that aren't considered assets are the most valuable assets. And all of the things that used to be considered the most valuable assets are no longer very valuable at all. Um, so the, the, well, this is an indication that we're just moving into a very different time in the marketplace. Yeah, 100%. And it's shifted so fast, isn't it? It seems to get faster as we, as we progress as well with the innovations and various things talking NFTs now as well. Not that it's, yeah. that's not a subject I completely understand by any stretch, but it's, it's the speed at which things move, I think. So, yeah. okay, so you, you've worked with huge um, 
plants of entrepreneurs on a, on a global scale. In terms of um, perhaps that, that motivation, that ability to go out there, be innovative, take those risks, have the ability to kind of push on even perhaps when things aren't potentially going your way. What do you feel are perhaps the character traits of, of true entrepreneurialism? Those people that um, just kind of get out there and, and, and go and achieve things rather than perhaps those people that perhaps sit back and they're not quite sure whether to go forward or stay where they are. What do you think are the perhaps key yeah, look, The first thing I'll say is that entrepreneurship is a lot bigger than the founder, right? So there are certain people who are their character, their, their disposition, their, you know, their, their personality is really well suitable for starting something new, right? And when I say starting something new, literally registering a company, setting up a bank account and starting something from scratch. Now that's not most people. Most people are not suitable for that, but that doesn't mean that they can't be part of the entrepreneur revolution. So um, when someone gives you an award called entrepreneur of the year, they don't give it to someone who doesn't have a team, right? That, that immediately precludes you from being part of entrepreneur of the year. If you say, oh, it's just me, yeah. then they say, well, you come back next year, right? Come back later on. So the, one of the first questions is how many people are on the team? Um, so entrepreneurship is about, you know, bringing people together in the spirit of entrepreneurship where we're all going to solve problems together. Um, and the value creation that happens in entrepreneurship is most often between the 10 to hundred million, um, jump. So businesses that go from zero to a million, that's great. That's proof of concept. Fabulous. Uh, well done, but not a lot of value gets created for anyone. Um, even if you've got a million dollar a year business, it pays good incomes or can pay a good income, but that's about it. You're, you're on a professional salary, a professional wage, but you've had to take a big risk to, to end up on a professional wage and you have an ongoing risk. Uh, between one to 10 million, it's a huge amount of stress uh, building a business from one to 10 million because essentially a lot of that time, you're too big to be small, too small to be big, you're under-resourced. Um, you know, you're fighting to put a lot of things in place that allow scale, um, but you're, um, you know, you don't have those things in place, but you have to run a business and build a business at the same time. Um, the scale up journey is the 10 to hundred million. You've got a proof of concept, you've laid the foundations for scale. Uh, and now you're able to go out there and, and grow a business and, um, and where people get rich is normally growing from 10 to 10 to hundred million. Now here's the great irony. The person who gets all the credit is the person who's really good at going from zero to a million right? That, that really entrepreneurial early stage person, the people who do a lot of the work, the people who go from one to 10, and then the people who really are worth their weight in gold are the ones who know how to go from 10 to 100. And in many cases, the entrepreneur from the 10 to 100 million journey uh, is often uh, wheeled out as a figurehead. And the grown ups do all the work um, for, for growing the business. So it's very common for 10 to 100 million growth that you'll be backed by a private equity firm. Um, the private equity firm will bring in an experienced COO, CFO. They might help you bring in a CTO if you're technology reliant. They might bring in some marketing experience, CMO. Uh, you, might retain the, you might retain the title of CEO, but what they'll really want from you is kind of motivating the team and giving little talks and being out there you know, on podcasts and stuff like that. Uh, and, um, and in, you know, maybe making some tough decisions, but ultimately, you know, the value creation happens when some grown ups show up. So look, the, the key thing here is that entrepreneurship is a team sport. You've got to be bringing all these great people together. The founder gets way too much credit, uh, you know, for setting up in the beginning. Uh, and really the glory belongs to the team who, who show up and, and, um, and make things happen. And entrepreneurial spirit is that idea that we can solve problems together. We can take some risks together. We can innovate together. Uh, you know, we can access, you know, new resources together. We can, um, you know, we're, we're going to go on this journey together that is about, you know, creating something from nothing. So, I mean, taking all of that into consideration, Give, give me a little bit about your journey. So how, how have you progressed? What's perhaps happened in your life that, I don't know if there was something that particularly failed catastrophically and it, it, it changed your mindset or your direction down a different path. Um, give me a bit of an insight into to 
perhaps how you've traveled through your journey? Yeah, so very entrepreneurial as a teenager, um, things like selling roses and organizing nightclub parties and doing garage sales and all those sorts of things as a teenager. And weirdly reading books, entrepreneurial books. So I was like 15, 16 and, uh, you know, <laughs> I've got a copy of the E-Myth um, and how to win friends and influence people and all of those kind of things buzzing around. Uh, Richest Man in Babylon. And, you know, I was reading that stuff as a teenager. So obviously something twisted uh, going on in my head <laughs> as a young entrepreneurial kid. But, um, I, you know, I probably should have been reading surfing magazines and stuff like that. But uh, I, was, uh, I was very into business. You chose well. You were 20 years ahead of me. <laughs> it was a little, little good fortune there. Um, and then as, at age 19, I went and joined um, a startup. And it was a very fast growth startup. Uh, I got to work directly with the founder, a guy called John. Um, and in two years, we went from absolute standing start, literally sitting around the table talking about what we'll call the company, what, what will the name of the business be. Um, and two years later, we had 60 employees, about 6 million of revenue. Um, and uh, we had big offices in Melbourne. And basically, we'd gone from, you know, a, a beachside uh, home that John had to inner city Melbourne you know, um, offices and I got to ride that journey. So I was John's right hand generalist. Most businesses start with a, a generalist team and then they end up as specialists. It's, it's actually one of the heartbreaking things when that shift happens, because a lot of the generalists who help get a business going become less and less valuable uh, once the specialists arrive. Um, so that happened to me. I, I um, kind of felt a bit displaced. I was really valuable in the first six months, nine months, coming up on 12 months. I, I invented my own side project in year two, where I took the business into some regional areas and I made $700,000 worth of sales and uh, 200 grand worth of profit. Um, and I went to John and I said, can I, can I become a shareholder in the business? <coughs> and he said, sorry, mate, if you want shares in a business, you'll have to go start your own. And, um, and I went, oh, maybe I should do that. And I actually had felt a little bit displaced. I'd felt that um, I'd been hugely valued at the beginning, but wasn't very valued uh, now that we were, we'd hit some scale. So I did, I left and I started my own business and I pretty much copied everything I'd learned in the first two years. I was 21 years old uh, at that stage. I started a business, I copied what John had taught me and I built a very successful business. It went from uh, zero to 1.3 million in year one and then 10.7 million in year three. So it was a very fast growing uh, business all before the age of 25. Had a team of, I think about 17 full-time people. Um, and we were a national, national business. Um, and then um, I, I had the opportunity to, uh, to do a partial exit of that business uh, and the opportunity was also to kind of expand into the UK, which was just more for fun than anything else. So I went and set up in London um, and, uh, and launched, a, launched a business here. It got hit pretty hard during the global financial crisis, went from £4 million of revenue back to £400,000 of revenue, lost 90% of revenue when the global financial crisis kicked in. Um, and, uh, and then rebuilt from there and, and built, and since we've, since then we've built a global business. There's currently, um, seven companies in the group. We have, uh, you know, we're global business offices in UK, Australia and, and Canada operating the three time zones. Um, and we take, we take venture, we've got a venture portfolio. We take stakes in, in uh, different companies and grow our different companies as well now. Amazing journey, and I know. Um, so I'm in a number of your your groups and see various things pop up. Talk to me about about Score App, which is something you're you're heavily involved in at the moment. Yeah, so Score App was a piece of technology we developed for myself or at my business, our business, and we needed a way of generating leads. So everything in business is downstream from lead generation. Uh, if you can't generate leads, then ultimately you don't have a business and it doesn't really matter what your business is. Uh, everything is downstream from lead generation. So one thing that's really common to, um, to successful entrepreneurs is they're fastidious about how they generate leads, how they get attention, how they capture signals of interest, how they basically fill up people's diaries with people to talk to. Um, and if you've got a B2C product, a consumer product, you need to generate leads of people of you know people who will promote that product or you know retailers or influencers um, if you've got a corporate uh, offering 
you're going to have to generate leads of the right decision makers to talk to, and they're going to have to become aware of you and then signal their interest in talking to you. So that whole process of getting on people's radar and capturing their attention and getting a signal of interest so that you can set an appointment with them, like literally that's every business and everything's downstream. And the reason I'm making such a point of that is because one of the big issues I see with most entrepreneurs is they just don't take that 10% seriously enough. You know, they, they think if they're putting all this energy into their products and their business and their team, and, you know, all these things that don't matter if you can't generate leads. Um, whereas if you've got a flood of leads coming in, you'll solve every other problem. There's no, you'll, there's no issue getting investment. There's no issue getting t talented people to come and join your, your team. Um, if you've got plenty of leads flowing in, every other problem is solvable. If you've got no leads flowing in, uh, it doesn't matter, really doesn't matter much else, right? So, um, you know, so it's the marketing engine that, that you need uh, to, to have uh, to take really seriously. So years ago, I came up with this idea of having online scorecards, online questionnaires, um, online what we call quizzes or, or scorecards, as a way of generating leads, as a way of being a front end marketing engine. So essentially, we had something called the key person of influence scorecard, and people answer 40 questions and they get a score. And that was a primary lead generator, it generated 90,000 leads, those leads are extremely data rich, we know exactly how to call people and talk to them about their result. Um, and also people are very open to getting a phone call. So if you fill in an online questionnaire and someone calls you up and says, hey, can I talk to you about how you scored and how your results came out and how to improve them? People are extremely open to that conversation. It's not a cold call at that point. It's a very warm call. So, um, so it was a win-win. The people taking the scorecard get immediate value because they learn something about themselves. Um, and people who, um, who, or us who ran the scorecard, get immediate value because we've got people engaging with us. So um, this was so successful that some of my clients asked the question, how do I build one of those scorecards? So we looked around to see if there was, anyone was building any software to do this properly. And there was great software like Google Forms and there was great software like Typeform for just simply collecting data. But it didn't do what we wanted it to do, which was we want to build a really good looking landing page so people want to take the scorecard followed by a questionnaire with a point scoring system uh, where we can establish a, how much each answer is worth as a point score followed by a results page that show you how you scored immediately so no one was doing those things in a sequence you had to bolt together several bits of technology so we thought you know what we own our own IT business let's build let's build some prototypes here um, so we built one very quickly, got 100 people who wanted it. Uh, we spun it out into its own company. Um, and now it's a very fast growth marketing tech company. So we, we now have, um, uh, we have uh, 1,600 clients, but 400 people signed up last month. So it, it's very, very fast growth. Uh, that is awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's on a good ramp. I say while you're explaining it now, a lot of the listeners to the, the guest list are um, predominantly from a recruitment background, sales, it's all about generating leads, clients and candidate leads. It's the ability to move faster than your competition on the information that's provided. The ability to be able to track things as they move. My head, my brain's going 100 miles an hour now thinking how that can, that can help to... Let's, let's imagine you just had a scorecard that said, um, should you ask for a pay rise? And um, are you ready to ask for a pay rise? So that's a candidate scorecard, right? So you're gonna say, you know, have you been in your role for more than two years? Do you have marketable skills? Um, uh, do you uh, speak up during meetings and, um, uh, and voice opinions? Uh, do you suffer from low self-esteem, low confidence? Uh, do you um, uh, get frustrated with the company culture, right? So you might, throw in some questions around that and then at the end people get a score and it says recommendation because of how you answered we think you should either a ask for a pay rise or b um look for look for a job at a better company you're ready to start looking would you like would you like to discuss the ability to to ask for a pay rise or talk to someone uh talk to someone about uh, joining a different company um, so you could have an online scorecard that does that. And that's a really, you know, people, 
people who are in that kind of looking zone yeah. engage with it. And now you've got candidate leads. Um, uh, you could also have for employers, um, high performance culture scorecard. Is your business attracting talent? Answer the, uh, answer the high performance uh, culture scorecard. You know, do you have a clear vision, mission and values? Do you have, um, uh, do you communicate uh, your vision and values? Do you pay bonuses for performance? Um, uh, do you have uh, share option schemes for high performing team members? Right, so you can put all of those kind of things in there and you can have the intangibles and the incentives um, and you can give people a score. You can say you've got nine out of 10 for intangibles, but two out of 10 for incentives, which means you've got a good culture on, you know, energetically, uh, but you're not paying enough. So we need to, you know, review your incentives program and then get some more candidates based on that. Um, you know, so you can then start having better conversations. You're not just another recruiter trying to have a cold call. You, you, you're following up with, with data and insights. That's huge and, uh, as well. I think, I think the ability to stand out from the masses, that's always been one of my key drivers. And I've always sold on the basis that I'm, a, I'm an ex-strategic qualified buyer by background. I'm not a salesperson, but I yeah. know what I expected from salespeople. So I knew how to deliver the service that I set out to do. And I think anything where you can go in and, and add value. I initially wrote that's top. How, that's how you're going to stand out. You're not, yeah. realistically, you're not going to stand out because you're more chatty or more persistent or, you know, more smiley. Like you're going to stand out because you're, you're solid. You've got solid insights. You know stuff that they don't. You've done the research that they haven't done. You can answer questions relating to their problems. The, the more you are tooled up with resources and insights about that business, the more they're going to rely upon you as an advisor and a trusted, you know, asset to their business. So, you know, all of this stuff about, you know, just, you know, be more chatty, be more friendly. It's great. But ultimately, if you're seen as a thought leader, if you're seen as someone who, you know, who's adding serious value and bridging, bridging gaps in their thinking, uh, they're going to rely upon you for years and years and years to build the business. 100%. So I think one of the main reasons I wrote my first book was to stand out. You don't get many recruitment consultants that have wrote a book. So the ability to differentiate yeah. and offer a book to a client as opposed to a mug, desk pad and pen. And, and even, and, if they, even if they never read it, they know you wrote it. Exactly. And it, and it lifts, and it, again, the credibility, the ability to elevate you to, to a higher level. The, the score app, the scorecards for me, honestly, my brain is running. And I know a lot of people that are listening to this are going to be sat there thinking, how can I implement that into what I do? Um, the examples you give are perfect, too. Um, okay. So in terms of, of, of you and the, the, perhaps the people you surround yourself with, who would you say over the years have perhaps been, if you were to name the, I don't know, your top three most influential people, who would they be and, and why? Well, over the years, the, the gentleman I mentioned, John, John was a great uh, mentor to me uh, in those first two years uh, where, where I learned from him by going through that startup uh, situation. Um, and then I was very fortunate to be mentored by a guy called Mike Harris, who had built three multi-billion pound businesses. Uh, he built First Direct and he built a, a bank called Egg and he built a division of a, of a telecommunications business that was worth two and a half billion. So he was a real professional CEO and leader. Um, and I learned an absolute uh, enormous amount um, from, uh, from Mike Harris. Uh, and um, the, the third one, I'm just trying to think um, at the moment, yeah, there's a, there's a coach or a consultant who, who I brought on who was post-exit, very successful, had great work-life balance, great family life, as well as successful in business. Uh, and just having a good coach or a mentor um, relationship with someone like that has been, has been really good value as well. Are you reading any books at the moment? What's, what's the book that's at the top of the list? Or the uh, currently, two books that I'm reading. Number one is Atomic Habits, which I'm a little late to the party on Atomic Habits. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's a great book. book. Uh, yeah, nice, quick, punchy book. Um, a great book I'm rereading is Thirst by Scott Harrison, which is about uh, a guy who 
um, stopped being a nightclub party promoter and started um, uh, raising tens of millions for clean water in Africa and clean water in um, uh, rural parts of Asia and basically clean water projects and, and bringing clean water uh, to the developing world. Um, and he applied his night, nightclub party promotional uh, ideas to, um, to, to fundraising and charity. So that was, uh, that's a great one um, that, that I'm a fan of. Just finished reading a book called The Private Equity Playbook, which was really good. Um, a book called Go Do Deals by Jeremy Harbour has been really good. And I'm about to start uh, a book by my friend Kathy Burke called Lead In. Kathy heads up uh, a very successful charity in Australia. Um, she's grown it from startup to multi multi million dollar charity. She's a great leader. She's worked all over the world um, on community projects and, and doing transformational projects. Uh, and uh, I find that people who lead charities are exceptional because they're very purpose and mission led. Um, they are often massively under resourced. And, um, and they have to try and figure all of that out and they learn a lot along the way. So, um, you know, I love, I love those stories. And, what, and what's next for you? What, what have you got perhaps that you're working on that you can talk about? Is there, is there big projects coming up that? Yeah, look, so I run a group of companies. Um, the, the central theme of what we do is developing entrepreneurs who stand out, scale up and make a positive impact through business. Um, so, because I'm really clear about that, what's next for me is just more of that at scale. Uh, so we just find ways to get entrepreneurs to stand out, scale up and make positive impact. Um, and uh, you know, my dent in the universe that I wanna make is pointing really smart entrepreneurs at big problems in the planet, like meaningful problems. I want entrepreneurs thinking about planting trees and I want entrepreneurs thinking about getting plastic out of the ocean. And I want entrepreneurs thinking about, you know, social issues and environmental issues. And, um, and I want people who are already solving those problems, charity CEOs, to become more entrepreneurial and learn from entrepreneurs so that someone who's the CEO of, a, of an environmental charity can learn from what we know about building personal brands and, and being able to scale through being a key person of influence. And... Um, so, you know, every, everything that I do relates back to that theme, even score app, which is marketing technology, marketing innovation, uh, is about democratizing data uh, and analytics and research and, and, and all of those hyper personalized tools that big companies have getting them in the hands of entrepreneurs <clears throat> so that they can become more successful. So they can solve more meaningful problems. The, the thing is, is that, um, you know, in 15 years ago, only ginormous companies had access to media. They were the only ones who could create videos and media and, and publications. And then along comes social media and democratizes that superpower. So big companies moved to data and data analytics and personalization. And that actually used to be the domain of small businesses, but they're doing it better than small businesses now. And they're doing it because they have these tools that allow them to do personalization at scale. Now, most small businesses don't even know that these tools exist and they sound scary. And the idea of doing data and analytics and personalization and autom automated marketing approaches sounds really like far-fetched. And what I wanna do it is make it as easy as it is to set up a Facebook profile and to make a post on Facebook. That's how easy I want to make it to do data and personalization and analytics so that essentially small businesses have got superpowers for, um, for, for being more effective with their marketing so that they can stand out, scale up, make a positive impact through business. Amazing and really exciting. If there's, if there's people that are within those sorts of circles that are listening, um, at whatever level, they've got that um, entrepreneurism, they've got their um, high up within the charities and the, how would they come and find you? Where's the best place to? So if they're interested in learning best practices, so doing training, joining an accelerator, being part of a community where we're all working towards those goals. An accelerator is a high performance environment for entrepreneurs. It's kind of like joining tennis club for, uh, you know, for entrepreneurship or joining team GB for if you're an entrepreneur. So if you want to join an accelerator, go to dent.global, www.dent.global. And that talks about how you uh, apply to become uh, an accelerator 
a participant. Um, and the, uh, the, if they're interested in, in lead generation, scoreapp.com uh, is where you go for that. So you can go and get a free, uh, free trial uh, on score app, you can set up your first online scorecard, see how easy it is, use one of our templates, customize it a little bit, um, and away you go. You've got yourself a uh, an online scorecard generating leads. I know what and I'll then be once doing you've next. got all of those leads, you can join an accelerator. Yeah. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's really good. I'll put all them links underneath this show as well and in the in the show notes. So if there's one single piece of advice you'd leave our listeners, it could be about anything and everything. What, what would you, what would you say? Uh, so I'll do a couple. The first one is that in every industry, there are key people of influence who have that brand. They have that person, personal brand and pretty much everything works once you've got that personal brand. So if you know, Richard Branson wants to go on radio, that will work. If he wants to use newspapers, that will work. If he wants to turn up and run an event, that will work. If he wants to hire people that will work. So to the degree that you have a brand, a personal brand, and that you've built that personal brand, the, to the degree people can Google you personally um, and see that you're, you're someone to work with, that works massively in your favor and it greases every wheel. Like uh, it's the engine oil for everything. Um, having that personal brand. Company brands, nobody cares. Product brands, nobody cares. Personal brands, people care a lot. There's twice as many people who follow Tim Cook as Apple. There's, there's uh, hundreds, tens of millions more people who follow Elon Musk than Tesla. Um, so a personal brand is much more important than a company or, or a product brand. So build that personal brand. That's the thing that is going to add engine oil to the whole engine. Um, number two, everything's downstream from lead generation. If you can't get your marketing engine right, forget about the rest of the business. The, the, the approach to building a business needs to be that you can get attention, engagement and action first. And if you can't get attention, engagement and action, it really doesn't matter what else follows that because without attention, engagement and action, uh, those three things make up what's called performance marketing. Performance marketing is optimizing for attention, engagement and action. And then the final thing I'd say uh, is that digital assets are the thing that will give you the best life you can imagine. So, you know, ultimately, digital assets are available anywhere in the world. Um, they're going to be available for decades to come. Anything you stick online is immediately available everywhere, and it's going to be available for 10 years plus. Um, and, uh, you know, super scalable. They're not going to lose any quality. You can, they can be watched by a billion people. Things like videos, podcasts, books, articles, blogs, um, you know, diagrams, uh, you know, visual kind of uh, images, all of that stuff is adding, doing a little bit of heavy lifting uh, for you. Every single digital asset comes along and does a tiny bit of digital, uh, digital heavy lifting for you. And the more digital assets you end up with, the more your life is being heavy lifted. You've actually got everything mostly happening on autopilot. It's all sitting out there in the you know, in the, in the digital world and life gets fun and easy and you end up being able to, you know, pick and choose the projects that you want and have fun along the way. Plan. I love that. I love that, Daniel, because there's so many elements in there that I've, I've, I've kind of imparted and acted on over the last four or five years. And if people take anything from that, it's definitely that at those end three points because they've made a huge difference to me. Daniel, a huge thank you. I appreciate it. You're a busy guy. <laughs> Cheers, Steve. Thanks for putting me on the show, on the guest list. <laughs>